It was the early 2000s, and images of something called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch were going viral. 80,000 tons of plastic floating in the Pacific. It's the largest accumulation of trash in the world's oceans. 1.6 million square kilometers. From the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Pacific Garbage Patch. It was a giant island of floating plastic waste that had formed in the Pacific Ocean, twice the size of Texas, three times the size of France, and even visible from space. Seeing these dystopian photos of trash taking over our waters sparked public outrage. Suddenly, plastic was public enemy number one. The state's plastic bag ban goes into effect today. Waging a war on plastic. We'll have to use alternatives to plastic bags. The plastic bag ban is expanding. Plastic bags seem to be one of the most hated things on the planet. It was destroying our planet, killing wildlife, and even entering our bloodstreams. So we had to get rid of it. All of it. But what if I told you that we got it wrong? Those images that caused all the panic? They didn't tell the whole story. And the idea of getting rid of all of our plastic? Well, that would destroy modern society as we know it. So why were we misled? And how come no one ever took the time to explain why plastic is good, actually? It all comes down to how information moves in the modern world. Every day we are bombarded with thousands of pieces of content, headlines, photos, viral clips, all fighting for our attention. And in that battle, accuracy doesn't win, emotion does. A single shocking image, even if misleading, can spread like wildfire, while nuanced, complicated explanations barely make a ripple. The internet favors simplicity over subtlety, and in a world where attention is currency, the most dramatic, extreme version of the story is the one that goes viral. In 1997, Captain Charles Moore was sailing from Hawaii to California when he noticed something strange. A steady stream of plastic debris, bottle caps, toothbrushes, tiny fragments of broken containers drifting endlessly across the ocean's surface. It wasn't just a few scattered pieces, it went on for kilometers. It wasn't a mountain of trash, it wasn't a field of trash, and it wasn't a patch of trash, Moore later said. Instead, the ocean looked like a murky soup filled with plastic of all shapes and sizes spread out across an area so vast that it couldn't be captured in a single image. And that's the problem. There is no such thing as a photo of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Satellites, drones, and even Google Earth struggled to capture an overview of something so spread out and ever-changing. But just because the viral images might have been misleading does not mean that the problem isn't real. Because what Captain Moore discovered wasn't a static island of garbage, it was something much worse. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch is a churning vortex of waste formed by swirling ocean currents known as gyres. These massive, slow-moving whirlpools act like traps, pulling in plastic debris from all over the world and holding it in a constant state of motion. As long as we keep dumping plastic into the environment, it's only going to get bigger. One 2021 study estimates that the patch is expanding at a rate of 2.5% per year, and even that might be a conservative estimate. So yes, there is a massive problem with plastic waste in our oceans, but just like the viral images of the garbage patch, it's been oversimplified. You might think that all of this plastic got here just because people are too lazy to recycle it, but that's not the case. Only 10% of what you throw in your recycling bin actually gets recycled. So what happens to the rest? And what can we do to stop more of it from ending up in our oceans and landfills? Well, some tech companies are already working on solutions for this very problem. And inside these tanks lie one of the most exciting ideas yet. But more on that later, because as you've already seen in this video, oversimplifying problems tends to create even bigger ones. So if we're going to fix plastic waste, we need to first understand how it got so complicated. When plastic was first invented, it was remarkably simple. The earliest synthetic plastic, Bakelite, was invented in 1907 as a replacement for materials like ivory, steel, and wood. It was a single material, durable, heat resistant, and mostly used for radios and electrical insulation. It was a breakthrough, but it was just the beginning. 
Then came World War II and plastic became essential. Nylon for parachutes and polyethylene for radar cables. After the war, industries saw its potential and plastic exploded into packaging, textiles, construction and medicine. But as industries demanded lighter and more versatile plastics, things got complicated. New types emerged, polyethylene, polypropylene and PVC, each with different properties, strengths and weaknesses. Suddenly, plastic wasn't just one thing. It was hundreds of materials, each designed for a specific purpose. And when the push for recycling came in the 1980s, there was a major problem. How do you recycle something that exists in so many different forms? That's when the resin identification codes were introduced. The numbers inside the recycling triangles that we see on plastic products today. They sort plastic into seven categories, ranked by how easily we can recycle them. The lower the number, the simpler the process. A type 1 water bottle? Fairly straightforward. A type 6 styrofoam container? That's where things get tricky. Just like there are different types of plastic, there are also different ways that we can recycle them. There are two main methods, mechanical and chemical. Mechanical recycling is the one that most people know. Sort the plastic, melt it down, and turn it into something new. Sounds easy, right? Well, it's not. Sorting takes time, it's expensive, and the whole system is ridiculously picky. That little blob of ketchup that you didn't bother rinsing out of the bottle? Yeah, that can ruin an entire batch. Because of these limitations, only certain plastics, mainly types 1 and 2, can be recycled this way, while the rest end up in landfills and oceans. So if we can't recycle the majority of plastic, you can start to see why so many people want to get rid of it altogether. But that would be a bad idea. Waking up tomorrow to a world without plastic might sound like some sort of utopian dream, but it'd really be more of a nightmare. Imagine stepping outside and realizing modern transportation is crippled. No cars, no buses, no airplanes. Plastic makes vehicles lighter and more fuel efficient. Without it, flights become more expensive, fuel consumption skyrockets, and entire industries grind to a halt. Need a life-saving surgery? not happening. There are no IV tubes, syringes, heart monitors, or sterile medicine packaging. Plastic is the backbone of modern healthcare. Without it, hospitals aren't just less efficient, they're dangerous. The same thing goes for our food supply. Plastic packaging is what keeps food fresh, preventing millions of tons of waste every year. Without it, food spoils before it ever reaches store shelves. Even the environment would take a hit. Plastic pipes last longer than metal ones. Plastic insulation makes buildings more energy efficient. Lighter plastic materials in cars and airplanes cut fuel usage and reduce emissions. Without plastic, we don't just lose convenience, we lose efficiency, sustainability, and safety. So no, getting rid of plastic isn't the solution. The real issue isn't that we use plastic, it's that we've never figured out how to deal with it once we're done. But that's all about to change because tech companies worldwide are developing cutting edge solutions as we speak. And one of the most intriguing ideas is about to be revealed inside these tanks. Meet Aduro Clean Technologies, a company tackling the plastic waste challenge with a cutting edge approach called hydrochemolytic technology. Unlike traditional mechanical recycling, which melts plastic down, HCT works at a much deeper level. It's a chemical recycling process that breaks plastic apart at the molecular level, transforming them back to their original building blocks. So how does it work? First, solid plastic waste is shredded into small pieces and combined with water, a catalyst, and a hydrogen source. This mixture is then sent into a reactor where heat and special ingredients break the plastic down into smaller, high purity liquid oils. These oils can be reused to create brand new plastic or even fuel. But what really sets Aduro apart is efficiency. Their process operates at a lower temperature than traditional chemical recycling methods, requiring less energy and producing fewer emissions. And it tackles an even bigger issue, the fact that plastic is made from fossil fuels. Creating new plastic requires extracting oil and gas, a process that depletes non-renewable resources and pumps massive amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere. By transforming existing plastics into reusable materials, Aduro's technology helps to reduce emissions and our dependence on fossil fuels. But this isn't about recycling. 
it's about rethinking plastic entirely. Aduro is pioneering a circular economy where plastic isn't discarded, but continuously recovered, repurposed, and reused. Now, you might be wondering, if this technology is so revolutionary, then why haven't we heard about it yet? Well, after 12 years of extensive R&D and building up their patent portfolio, Aduro is currently in full swing, scaling up their technology and building their pilot plant this year. With eight patents and proprietary innovations, they're transitioning from lab-scale experiments to full-scale commercial operations, helping turn plastic waste into a valuable resource for the future. Want to learn more about how Aduro is revolutionizing recycling? Click the link in the description and see how you can be a part of the solution. So just like those viral images of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, the Pacific Waste Crisis isn't as simple as it seems. Plastic isn't inherently bad. It's a material that powers modern life, from medicine to transportation to food preservation. And now with breakthroughs like Aduro's technology, we have smarter ways to manage it. But innovation alone won't solve the problem. We still have to take responsibility to reduce waste where we can, replace plastic when better options exist, and rethink how we use it in the first place. The real solution isn't about choosing between plastic and the planet. It's understanding that, like most things, it's not black and white. It's more complicated than that. And if we actually want to fix it, that's where we need to start.